So, uh, who can tell me what we're doing? What are we doing? Can anyone speak in English? Um, can anyone say in English? Anna. Uh, we're showing that the dual space of LP is also LQ. Right, so the dual space of LP is, is LQ, right? So, um, LP dual is L, LP prime, right? LP dual is LP prime, right? What does that mean? That means that, um, right, uh, that, um, well, uh, right, what, what's LP dual? Right, LP dual, let's just talk through the language, right? LP dual, what is that? What's LP dual? What does that mean? Share? I don't remember. You don't remember? <coughs> what's the dual space? Right. The dual space is the space of mm, not just linear functionals, but mm. bounded linear functionals. Mm. Right. Okay. So this is the space of the collection of bounded linear functionals, linear functionals on LP. Right. LP has um, LP has a norm. Right. So it's all these guys L that go from LP into R. And right, and they have to be linear, and they have to be um, they have to satisfy a boundedness rule, right? What's the bound? They have to be linear and they have to be bounded. What does bounded mean? Just to make sure that we, we know our language. I don't know what exists and larger than zero such that L F belongs to L B and less than equal M. Right, so L F is less than or equal to m? Is that right? That's not the same. Times the norm. Times the norm of that, right? And what's the point I mean here? Absolute bias, right? Like we need absolute bias, right? So it, this, we have to, we're saying that, um, um, that right, this, these are the linear, linear functionals and they have, this, they have to have a bound, right? OK. So, um, Okay, so that seems a little peculiar, right? Because these uh, LP prime, what's LP prime? LP prime is not linear functional, right? LP prime, is, LP prime is a bunch of functions, right? So we're not really saying that it's, it's equal, but rather that there's, an, there's some sort of isomorphism between it. There's some sort of correspondence, right? That everybody in LP prime corresponds to um, some linear functional, uh, bounded linear functional of LP. Um, any of bounded linear function on LP corresponds to some function in LP prime. Right? What's the relation? Those of you who looked at the text, um, what's the relation? Right? How do we get from a function in LP prime? There should be some sort of corresponding, um, some sort of corresponding functional on LP. Right? So you have some function uh, G in LP prime. Right? That should correspond to some functional. Um, so linear functional on L, on LP, right? Um, what is it? Does anyone? What's what? What is? How do we? How how does one? How does one create? What's the correspondence? What's the correspondence? What's the correspondence? Does anyone know? Is that you um, you create the the functional the functional right? It's going to be going from L P into R. How is it going to how does it work? You take a function and then you map that you map that to the integral of the function against G. Right. So the functional says integrate the functional that you get from G is the integrate against G function. Okay. So L G. Right, takes something and then returns to you the integral. Right, it has this hole here. Right, it says, whatever you give me, I'm going to integrate that guy against g, and that will give me a number. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So let's make an obvious observation. Is it linear? Of course. Right. Right. Of course, it's linear. Right, because if you take f1 plus f2. Well, here you're just going to get in the interval of f1, f2, f1 plus f2 against g, which is going to be the sum of the integrals. Right? 
right? If you take LG of alpha f, well then you see alpha pulls out, right? Because so the linearity of the integral gives you linearity of this functional, right? Makes this a linear functional. Am I, going, am I going too fast? Is this course going too fast in general? No. Close your eyes. Is this course going too fast? Raise a finger if this course is going too fast. Okay. Because if you... Uh, uh, okay. 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 So everything seems all right. But, uh, yeah. I don't want to lose people out of not... Uh, not recognizing that people are lost. Yeah, okay, not lost. Okay, 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 okay. So, um, okay, so that's 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 the relation, right? Um, given any um, given anybody in L P prime, we um, given anybody in L P prime, we say we're gonna we're going to define L G from L P into C by um, um, It'll take f, right? Define this thing by um, uh, LG of f equals the integral of f against g for all f and l. Okay. And uh, why is that? Why does that make sense at all? The integral of f g. How do we know that that converges? By how is it equality, right? So we don't. Without that. We don't know that integrating a function in LP against a function in LP prime is a good thing, right? That could be infinite, right? So Powers inequality assures us that um, this, this is finite, right? We know from Powers inequality, right? Okay, okay. We know by Powers inequality that this, this is defined, right? That LG F in absolute value um, is bounded by the norm of f p prime. Right, so this is finite. Right? Does this make sense? And then the second thing that, that, it, that this gives us is that um, it gives us a statement about the norm, right? Right. What, what else does how does inequality give us? Well, what can we say about the norm of LG? What? What's your, what can we say about the norm of LG as as a linear function? Okay. So this is all. You know, this is all definition chasing, basically. Right, so think for one minute, what is the norm of a linear functional? Okay, think for, just think for one minute. I'm going to walk, up, walk around outside. Functional 
And we know, one fact about it, the, uh, the norm of LG as a linear functional is controlled by the norm of G. gives rise to a bounded linear functional, a bounded linear functional. That is, I mean, every element of LP prime corresponds to an element of LP, uh, LP dual. Okay. Share your again. Are you angry? No. Okay. <laughs> Good. Are you cold? It's warm. Not anymore. What? Not anymore. Okay. I'll just attribute this, attribute this to my inability to read facial expressions. <laughs> okay, okay. So, you know, um, what we're going for is that we're going for this, right? Okay. So, um, so here's the theorem, which says that not only does everybody in LP prime give rise to, to a linear functional, but every linear functional arises in this way. Okay. So, um, uh, P between 1 and infinity, uh, possibly equal to 1, uh, given, any, given any linear functional in LP, given any linear function on LP, um, there exists a G in LP prime, such that um, L is actually L sub G, right, using the above notation. Okay. Further, further, um, uh, the norm of L uh, turns out to be, the norm of L as an element of the dual space turns out to be the norm of G. It turns out to be equal, not just less than or equal to, but actually equal to the LP prime norm of G. Okay. Right? In other words, we have an isometry. Right? We have this map, this map L that goes from LP prime to LP star is actually an isometry. Right? It preserves the norm preserves the norm. And this is, it's in this sense that LP and LP, LP prime and LP's, right, LP parentheses star are the same thing. Okay. How are you, Spencer? Good? I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that people don't drop out of the class. Are you going to drop out of the class? <laughs> <laughs> Show these two spaces um, are can be identified. Okay, 
And um, let's start off with the following lemma. Um, so, uh, so if G is an LP prime, then, um, uh, well, we just saw that this is true, that then LG is an LP dual, and um, the norm of LG, the norm of LG, LG star, um, actually equals the norm of G. If I don't put the norms on, I, I sometimes I get lazy and I just leave the norm off. It's, it's clear what that is, right? If I say the norm of LG, well, LG is an LG prime. I, I mean the LG prime norm. Okay. Okay. So, um, okay. So the proof of this, right? Okay. So, uh, done. Right? We just did this. This direction we already did. Right, that the that the LP that the norm of this guy is a linear functional is bounded, and this is by always in the long as we just saw. Matthew made it done already. Right. And so we need to show the opposite direction. Right. Sure, your eye goes in. Why? I've never seen that notation for the, which way you're going before. Uh, I'm showing. This one, I figured one. it out. This one. But I wish I had never seen it. Okay. 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 So what we're going to do is something pretty, pretty cool, and this happens a lot. Um, uh, it looks sort of magical. Um, we'll show that um, uh, the supremum. Right, remember what this thing is, right? Um, this thing, uh, this thing, of course, is the supremum of LG F over all FP of norm one. Right? Okay, and we know that that thing is bounded above, bounded above by this thing. Okay, we'll show that the supremum actually. Um, Attains, so attains G P prime um, for appropriate choice for cleverly chosen uh, F of of norm one. Okay, right? because if it if it attains that and it's bounded above by bounded above by that, then it must be that. Okay, so um, so here we go. Let f of x be um, g x to the p prime minus one uh, sine of g x divided by um, g p the p prime norm of g to the p prime minus one. And this is going to be this is going to be the right f. Why is this the right f? Why is this the natural choice to make? Okay. Why is this the obvious choice to make? This so you this looks like it's pulled out of the hat, right? Like it's a da da here it is, right? Like that. But if you think about it, it's actually you're almost forced to choose. So let's think about what we're trying to do. Right? Think about what we're trying to do. We're trying to um, we this thing here, right, is the integral of fg, right, right, and the bound that we get is obtained through Helder's inequality, right. The bound that we get is obtained through Helder's inequality. Well, when do you get equality, right? What we're hoping is to get for f of norm 1, we're hoping to actually get g of p, uh, the, the LP prime norm of g, right? right? Well, when does that happen? When do you, when do you get equality in Helder's inequality? This you did in the homework, right? This you did in your homework, right? 
you get it, right? It's that uh, whenever you have two functions and f g f prime it is proportional to uh, the magnitude of g prime, right? There's some constant. There's some constant, right? Equals some constant times that, right? So this sort of defines it. For, this sort of gives it to us, right? Right? The magnitude of that had better be proportional to the magnitude. Some it better be some constant. Some constant times the magnitude of g to the p prime over p, also called p prime minus one. Okay, this p prime minus p. Uh, uh, p prime over p is p prime minus one. Okay. Okay. So we know it's got to be some multiple. You know, we're you know in the absolute value, uh, we're sort of forced. If we look at the absolute values, we're sort of forced to forced to make this choice. Okay. And we want this thing to be of norm one. Right. We want this thing to be norm one. So so we divide by this. Right. This will this will normalize. This will normalize that. Okay. So, okay. so I hope it's becoming a bit more natural uh, why why we why we make this choice. Okay. So, um, <coughs> right. Uh, so we observe observe then that um, well, first off. Um, Equals one over g prime g prime um, g of x p prime, right? Because of course p uh, p prime over p p prime over p is p prime over one. Right? Right? As we just said, right? so if we take the magnitude of this and raise it to the p power. We're going to get the p prime p prime p prime power on the right side, right? Okay. Um, uh, so we get that, and also that um, the f, f uh, the LP, LP norm of f, well, the LP, LP norm LP norm of f, well, that's going to be um, Right, it's going to be the integral, the integral of this thing. Right, so prime 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 mu, right, which is of course one. I mean, you know, we chose it that way. Right, we chose this. We chose this constant. Which is this constant, so that it would be normalized. And obviously, right? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And then the last bit, we say, well, look. Um, finally. When we integrate f against g, what do we get? Well, we're going to get um, f f times g. Yeah, I'm still writing f. F times g. Here's g. Prime, right? 
integral of g to the p time, right? right? That is to say, we get um, the p prime norm, p prime norm of, of g to the p prime power divided by g of p prime to the p prime minus one, right? So we just get one of them. So indeed, or we could just cite the homework and say, look, these guys are, um, these guys satisfy that, that rule, that, that rule of proportionality. And so we know that by um, if we get the absolute value of this, we're gonna get we're gonna get that. But I, this is this is this is we throw in the sign so we don't even have to take the absolute value. Any questions? Any questions on how, how this is done? It seems sort of, like I said, it seems sort of arbitrary. Right? This, this choice of F seems sort of arbitrary, but you see that in fact you're forced to it. Right? There's no other, there's, uh, I think there's no other option. Yeah, there is no other option. When you're reading the textbook, that's how you want to think. Whenever you encounter something that seems mysterious or like pull out of the hat, you want to think, why is this completely obvious? Why is this completely obvious? Okay. And, uh, right. Because if it's not completely obvious, if, it's, if there's any amount of magic to it, then you, don't, you actually don't understand it. Done this for the case uh, p between between one and infinity, and it's actually true of the endpoints as well. But I'll let you I'll let you read those. This is I think the most important case, or the most illustrative, uh, most instructive. Okay. okay. So um, so that's one lemma, which tells us that in fact the the LP prime norm of, of the functional that you get equals the LP. Um, I'm sorry, the, the, the dual norm of L, the linear functional, turns out to be the LP prime norm of the, of the, func of the function that gives rise to it. That's part of the theorem. Um, <coughs> the next lemma uh, will be really used um, Will be used, uh, yeah, to get to get the uh, to 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 do the opposite direction, right? To go from the linear functional back to the function. Okay, right. That's that's what we don't. Know. We really at this point we really understand the the process of going from the function to the functional, but we don't understand the reverse process. Okay. So the next one that deals um, will will eliminate that. So, uh, two. Um, if G is integral on all sets of finite measure, and um, the supremum of the integrals of F against G um, for F. Norm one and f simple. Okay, f simple is finite. Um, then in fact, g is an LP prime, and the LP prime norm of g is n. Sort of saying that, well, if you have, if 
you have a function and you create a linear functional on it of it, right? You create, suppose you have some g, and you create a linear functional out of it, you have the LG linear functional. Okay. And it turns out that for all simple functions, you get this sort of knot. Okay. Turns out for all simple functions, you get this knot. Not on all functions, but for all simple functions, you get this knot. Then, in fact, that G that you started off with must be an LP prime. Then, in fact, that G must be an LP prime, and you know the norm of it. So this one, this group, uh, is the one where I got a little bit, a little bit stuck uh, this morning. Here we go. So here's the group. Okay. So um, just going to put a fact from measure theory. Um, uh, for such for such g, it's possible to create a sequence of these n of simple functions Do you all remember what simple functions are? Simple functions? Yes? Okay. Just sums of char linear combinations of characteristic functions um, there's a sequence of simple functions um, such that uh, a sequence treats of n of, of simple functions such that one, all of them are dominated by g, okay. and two, they converge pointwise to g. Okay. This is kind of a typically an exercise given in, in a real analysis. So remember, we're trying to um, we're trying to show that G um, that G actually is in uh, uh, that G actually is in LP prime. So here we go. Um, this, this is sort of a funny thing. So um, let Fn be um, this should look so familiar. G n, uh, the absolute value of G n to the p prime minus one um, over the norm of G n um, to p prime p minus one times the sine of G. Okay. Notice again. Why do we know that these things are are, are in LP prime? Right. We're trying to show that L, that G is in LP prime. Right. We're trying to show that G is in LP prime. How do we know that these G's of n are in LP prime? Right. All we know about the GNs are that they are simple functions. Well, that gives it away. They're simple functions. Right. So they're in LP. They're in LP prime. So we don't. Um, okay, and you might uh, notice something funny, right? We took the sine of g rather than the sine of g, gn. Okay. First, I thought that was a typo. That's, there is a typo, but that wasn't the typo. I thought that this was correct, this was incorrect, and later was correct, but in fact, it's the opposite. This is correct, and there's a typo here. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, so notice again that this thing has one, one and you say, well, um, let's consider, um, let's consider f n against g, the integral of s, s of n against g. Okay. Well, first off, we know that that thing, right, these guys are all norm 1, the, the s of n's are all of norm 1, and they're all simple, so we have a bound on that f n, right? 
Julia, this thing is bounded by n. Hypothesis. Um, okay, but what is that? This thing is going to be 1 over g sub n p prime p prime minus 1 times the integral of g sub n x to the p prime minus 1 times g times its sine, so that's going to be g, right? We know that g is is uh, g is bigger than g sub n, right? This thing is bigger than g sub n, right? So this is smaller than, uh, and this bounds this thing bounds from above, right? Uh, g n to g prime. Opposite, opposite. So that gives us um, that gives us that uh, that gives us one one direction. Right? To show the opposite direction, we just just hold as an equality. The opposite direction is easy. Right? We just say, well, but I know that I hold as an equality. So we have this sort of control. We have this sort of control, and. Um, Let's take, take the supremum over all f simple of norm of norm one. Right? And I'll give you that prime um, down below by, by f. So just take the supremum of, over both sides, right? And we know that the supremum on the left hand side is Where, where does that bound come from? The um, m bound uh, over by the integral of f n times g. I'm sorry. Where did after consider? Consider. Yeah, the first. So consider this. Okay, it equals that. But also, but we know. Oh, that's what. This is smaller than m because it's supreme. Because it's, right, because the supremum over all simple functions is m. Okay. Okay. Right. 
S of n is simple, right? Remember, the G sub n's were chosen to be simple, right? G sub n's were chosen to be simple, and S of n is just the absolute value, is a constant times the absolute value of G sub n to some power. It's also simple. Okay. So the G sub n's are simple, too. Okay, cool. Got it. Thank you. And again, I'm, I'm skipping a couple of cases, um, but the, this is the this is the most important case. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, I'll let you I'll let you read the other two cases. So there's there's some easier cases. Case B equals one and infinity B equals false. Otherwise, we'll stay in chapter one for that. I, I, looking back at my, my old function analysis um, notes, it seems that um, my teacher uh, in graduate school basically said, okay, so I assume that you know this and this and this and this and this and this and this. Okay, the open mapping theorem, the von Steinhaus principle, this, that, that. And that's like chapters one, two, three, one, three and four. <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's uh, I, I guess we were just assumed to, to learn it. Just, I, I think what he meant was go along and read about it. But, but I don't think that would, that would work. That would, that would not keep students in class. Okay. 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 So, so now let's go for the theorem. Now let's go for the, the theorem. Function G 
so that if you integrate against it, right, you have some you have some measure, right? You have some measure, and it turns out that um, there exists there exists some g such that the measure of a set is just the integral of g over that set. Right? So recall random recall random mechanism. Right, let me write it this way. Characteristic function of e. Right. Okay. Well, if if this is based on some linear, if this if this is if this function is based on a linear function, linear functional, well then, this relation is going to hold for combinations of of characteristic functions. Linear combinations of characteristic functions, namely simple functions, right? And so we will be able to extend this thing to um, we'll be able to get that this equals um, this um, combinations of simple functions will be so linear, just like this. L of s or s simple equals this, right? And then from the simple functions, it will be a limiting, limiting argument to get all of our p. Um, as long as we can show this is bounded, well, then it's continuous, right? And if we have this relation on a, on a dense subset of LP, namely the simple functions, right, then we can extend it to all of LP. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the strategy. The strategy is create a measure Create a measure based on the linear functional. Right? You're given a linear functional. Let's let's make a measure based on let's create a measure based on that linear functional. Right? If we do, and we're able to show that um, right, this is a bounded linear functional, right? Um, if we do, and we're able to show that this measure is absolutely continuous with respect to mu, then by radon nicodem, we have this relation. But this thing based, being based on a linear functional means that we can take linear combinations, right? So if we can take linear combinations, that gives us this, that gives us the relation, the desired relation for simple functions. But the simple functions are dense in LP, and so by the continuity of L, we can extend to all of LP. And this relation will hold on all of LP. Okay. So that's, that's the proof right there. The end. No, <laughs> no let, me, let me write it up. Okay, but that's the strategy. That's the strategy. Okay. So, group, right? Uh, 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 create a function on sets. A function on sets. Like a set function. New, right? And right, it's gonna take in. Uh, Measurable sets, and it's going to give us back some number. Well, the number is going to be this L of pi e. So just look at L on the characteristic function of e. Okay. Okay. So first off, observe. Right. Observe. Um, well, the absolute value of pi e. Is controlled, of course, by the um, by the absolute value. I mean, it's equal to it's equal, it's equal to the absolute value of L of pi. Duh. Right. Well, okay. What am I going to say next? What do I know about L of pi? E? What kind of control do I have on this thing? Bounded, right? L is bounded, right? So I know that this is bounded by the the dual norm, right? The the, the norm of this guy is a linear functional times, right? Um, times the LP norm of pi e. Pi 
each of these IDs is in LP because the space is finite. Okay. Okay. And then you think about well, what is the LP norm of chi e? Well, if you take the LP norm of chi e, must be what do you get? You're integrating the function one on e, right? So you get the mu measure of e to the p to the, to the p power. Okay. So you get L mu e. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to skip part that shows. So I'll let you read the part that shows. Um, read the part that new is actually palpably additive. Right, the 
tail plus the first premise. And then by finite, finite additivity, we know that mu of e equals mu of e n star, like the, the union, the tail, plus these first three guys, and the one capital N. Right? And then you let n go to infinity. So, um, so we get that this thing actually is, uh, this new that we created from the L actually is a measure, and now we know it's an absolutely continuous measure, and then the rest of the argument goes as we, as we already said it. Uh, just, I'll just write it down. Um, so, so. Any questions? Any questions? So this is it, right? This gives us um, oh oh um, uh, so also we we have to um, so what we have is that this L is realized um, as integration against G, right? So right now what we have is thus L actually equals L G for that for that G. But we haven't we haven't shown that that, that we, we need to observe that, that G is actually an LP prime. Right, so we're not completely done. Okay. So that should have been a question. Um, okay. So for this, we say, well look, um, so we need to, we still need to show that G is in LP. This function g that we got out of rather than rather negative um, actually is an LP prime and has has the right norm. Okay. Um, well, um, 
if we look at supremum over F simple um, as norm less than or equal to 1 of the integral of FG, right? What we just said is that equals um, the supremum of L. over a simple um, f less than equal to 1. Right. But what is that? What's the supremum of the absolute value of L acting on simple functions of, of norm less than 1 in LP? That's actually going to equal the supremum over the supremum over over just any function, any LP functions of norm norm less than equal to one. Because the simple functions are dense, right? Because the simple functions are dense and L is continuous, right? So this is the norm which equals the norm L. People look a little, little, they're smiling a little bit. Why, uh, Anna, why are you smiling? Is it okay or is something something wrong? Why is it show that she is in a prime? Oh, okay. So why does it show that this that G is in G is in P prime? You remember what the previous lemma said? The previous lemma said that if we have a G and if we look at this thing and it turns out to be some number. Right, the lemma we the lemma we just did um, right before this it was it was a long it was a, it's we just did it but it was a long time ago okay, because we it's before we started this the lemma we did right before we started this group. okay you remember it said if you know that you take this g and you integrate it against simple functions and you get the supremum equals some number then g actually is in LP and the norm of L, the, the LP is in LP prime excuse me. And the LP prime norm of it is, is this. Okay. So this is where this, that second lemma comes in, at the very end here. Okay. So by lemma two, by lemma two, um, uh, G actually is an LP prime. And the LP prime, LP prime norm of it is the, the norm of L of the linear function. And so that's the but not really, because you still need to, to extend it to the case of, of sigma finite rather than finite metric spaces. But that's, that's, that's not hard. Okay. Okay, how is everybody? Are you all right? Good, good. Don't, uh, um, yeah, so this is pretty cool, right? It has, you know, it has a strategy, you execute the strategy. Um, you know, the people who did this, whoever thought of this was you know, really great. Um, um, I wish I thought of something like this. Um, I, um, once I had lunch with, um, with, once I was having lunch with my postdoc advisor, Alberto Torchinski in Indiana, and he said, what? Uh, so what mathematical result would you plagiarize if you had the ability to plagiarize it? That is, that result would have your name on it for the rest of the time, even though you didn't do it, right? You know, because it's, it's often the case that you know, somebody's name gets associated with something, even though that person didn't, either did it later or actually didn't do it at all. I usually it's that the person did it later. And I, in a sort of um, uh, lamely said, I think I would go for the Caron Caron sigma decomposition, uh, which is a tool in like a, it's like a, it's like a hammer in uh, harmonic analysis. Like everything, you use a Caron sigma decomposition. Like everything can be solved using the Caron sigma decomposition. And he said, he said something like, "You are thinking 
too low. <laughs> you're thinking too low, or like you 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 your sights are too low, or you you, you know, something along those lines. He said, I would go for the fundamental theorem of calculus. It's like, oh. <laughs> Thank you. 